Okay. I, I think we can slowly move back to the chairs and we'll start with that. Yay. Okay, so I will start with a couple of words and uh, after I will hand to the speaker. Yes, please take a seat. Perfect. And I think we're still going to have like a bunch of time and uh, plenty of time basically to talk about things, so um, no worries about that. Okay, so um, welcome everybody again. I, I hope, like, who of you first time here? Ooh, that's actually quite many people. It's always surprising that, you know, like we're having quite like a big meetups, right? And every next time there is like still like a bunch of people who are first time here. Um, but it's pretty good. So um, what I wanted to say is that, uh, um, yeah, you can see that there was some of you already here. Maybe you can even recognize yourself. Um, yes, um, we have today's kind of like a joint meeting between um, hacking machine learning and uh, applied deep learning. Um, yes, and we're going to be talking about uh, uh, many cool things. Um, idea behind that, that um, it's not, and I mean, if you hear not the first time, you already heard it like multiple times, that it's not uh, um, me or um, like another speakers or anybody else like on this kind of like uh, part of the stage, it's like everybody of you. So um, it's about community and uh, uh, if you have something cool, just like let us know and uh, maybe next time you're going to be like talking about, uh, I don't know, your use cases of PyTorch or whatever else you have. Um, our own uh, our main medium basically is uh, Meetup, so uh, we're posting like things there and uh, you can always find what's happening there. Um, and as I mentioned, this one is about uh, hacking machine learning and uh, another one that um, Stefan is uh, uh, kind of uh, bootstrapping today is uh, Minic Applied Deep Learning. So um, if you have any questions about those two, just feel free to approach me or Stefan. Um, we also had this idea and it's still kind of like work in progress um, to have more um, I don't know, like smaller peer-to-peer -peer community things. Like we kind of like started bootstrapping Slack and uh, hopefully um, next steps would be to make like more active discussions there. So um, it's not that you need to wait for next meetup to ask your questions, but feel free to just like write it there and uh, hopefully somebody gonna be, you know, helpful enough to answer those things and uh, help you out. Or um, as a case of uh, Munich Kegel uh, meetup, they also use it as uh, like communication channel in a way. So. Um, you can, you know, build your some interest group, or maybe you are uh, going through the course of uh, Andrew and G of on deep learning, right? And you would like to discuss how cool things are there. Um, I think it's also like a good, um, you know, communication channel to have it running. Um, yes, and it's how it looks like. Uh, we're also trying to make Twitter like more active there. Um, <laughs> so far, so good. We're getting like so people, but uh, it's not like super crazy. So um, if you active Twitter. Um, user, just feel free to uh, get some information there. Um, in many cases, uh, you know, we're saying that uh, please use microphone because we do some recording or not all of you in the city when event is happening. And in many cases, we were recording some stuff, but uh, it took us quite some number of weeks to put it online. Uh, finally, it's there. So we put uh, uh, five out of uh, six videos from, uh, oh no, not six, out of seven videos from the last three meetups. So if you happen to be first time at this meetup, um, you can still find some stuff uh, on the YouTube. Um, what is kind of missing is uh, like a last uh, video from uh, uh, TensorFlow guys because they need to kind of like confirm that the uh, you know, video has whatever they're expecting to be there like from PR team and it takes like a bit of time. So once I get a uh, go from them, I can also share it there. Um, yeah, and uh, like one more. Um, yes, in many cases, uh, we actually had a discussion, like, or a short question from one of the member community, and they were like, so how does it work? Like, do you get pizza for free because you're organizing meetups? Hmm. I wish, but unfortunately, it's not like that. Um, there is always, uh, you know, some company in the background that does it, and uh, if you feel like, um, you know, your company want to be this, uh, like, on a 
um, on a good side and basically support local communities, uh, just let me know and we can, I don't know, like you can be a sponsor of beverages or maybe like good locations that we can host uh, all of you. But um, yeah, just let us know. And uh, it's like, I think it's super helpful. Like, um, um, yeah, for those of you who first time here, um, because we also, or I got a question like, oh yeah, is it like um, a co-working space or like what, what is this company? Um, not really, I mean, we work together, but uh, we work for the same company here. It's called Stylite. Um, I think it might be like pretty hard to read what's happening there. Um, but the idea there is that we're trying to make, you know, this like leading style and shopping guide. <laughs> that means Id ideally that we aggregate information from different like, um, I don't know, shops, let's say, Zalando, Asos, Zappos, whatever you name it. We do some fancy, or not sometimes, not so fancy, machine learning and some ranking stuff, and uh, we understand what our products are, what are additional features of those things. I don't know, let's say um, occasion, right? So those shoes are good for parties. Those uh, material is good for office or whatever you name it. And plus, uh, um, there is like a waste number of uh, categories or tags that we um, need to classify and uh, we do all those things. Plus, we also need to understand like, you know, um, what kind of uh, click-through rate we have like of different products, what um, products are people interested in and uh, how to show them the most relevant ones. Um, yes, it's a stylite. So if you have any questions about stylite, you can ask me or any other styliters that we have in the room. Can we put hands of styliters? Yes, there is Markov machine learning here or here, and uh, Stefan also somewhere here. So uh, feel free to approach us and uh, ask how we do that. Um, yes, um, as I said, you can your name could be here or your company name, and um, we definitely need you for that. Um, for today, we have uh, Stefan talking about um, how we use like uh, RNN and PyTorch and uh, what is sequence to sequence and uh, how it might be helpful for all your amazing use cases. Um, yes, uh, next event uh, we are planning for um, somewhere mid-September. Um, we still kind of like open with speakers. Um, we have like a couple of topics, but if you have something cool or maybe something small that you just did with machine learning or yeah, machine learning, deep learning, or classical machine learning. Um, just let me know, and uh, it's, it shouldn't be like you know, like I think one of the problems that people are thinking, yeah, like it's something that I did like on my own. It's nothing cool to share with community. Um, but the bias usually is there is that you already invested a couple of weeks of or even months, right? And this like not so complicated or not so advanced. It might save somebody like a couple of weeks or months, right? So even if you did some cool project, um, I think it's cool to share with community. Maybe it's not going to take entire hour. Maybe it's going to take like 10 or 15 minutes, but it's still helpful to you know open discussion and uh, you can still get like lots of feedback from other people. So um, don't be afraid of doing those things. Um, if you have any questions or concerns of being speaker or you know like present your topic, also talk to me and uh, I think we can solve that. Um, yes. All about community thing. Um, as I said, we interested about long talks or small ones. Also volunteers. Um, so if you feel like uh, design of this thing is like not very beautiful, and you're a designer, you can help us or any other help. Like always, uh, more than welcomed. Um, and as I said, like uh, we always looking for sponsors in terms of location, beverages. So if you can uh, help us with that, we're always helpful. Um, happy to receive that. Yes, in terms of uh, formats, uh, we still kind of like flexible and uh, uh, experimenting with that. Um, so yeah, like we will announce something like maybe a bit later. But if you can support with something or feel like um, it's your thing, just like let me know and uh, we can sit together and like see how we organize it. Um, yes, that's more or less all from my side, and uh, I'm giving a microphone back to actual speaker here, so to Stefan, <laughs> please welcome. Thanks, Lassie. Awesome, Hey guys, is this on? Test? Cool, so how is everyone doing today? Who would rather be in a beer garden right now versus uh, talking about code? Um, let me get this going. So, Okay, cool. Well, my name is uh, Steve, as you guys heard. Um, so first of all, a show of hands. Um, who is familiar with neural networks and has worked with them before? 
and who's totally brand new? Like, that's totally fine. I'm just trying to get a gauge of uh, people. Um, so most of you guys have some sort of idea what's going on here, right? Make sense? Maybe. Um, so my plan with, with this is to sort of talk about some of the stuff that I work with, um, talk about PyTorch, why in my use I think it's kind of important, and also um, some of the research areas that I work in um, to kind of inspire you guys here, um, to show you some of the cool models, to give you ideas, and then to get feedback. So if I talk really fast, I apologize. If I get lost, please just, this, I want to have this as open-ended and beneficial as possible for everyone here. So please have, don't be shy if I go too fast or it's too basic or too com complex. Um, my initial idea was to do sort of like a Jupyter Notebook Live thing, but then I realized that's probably a terrible idea. You know, live demos are sort of not the best thing to always do. Um, and I'm not a startup right now, so, you know, I don't have to actually do that. So I will skip that. But I will be releasing the Jupyter Notebook afterwards for it so that you guys can sort of learn this. So, um, pardon these sort of trend transitions. I don't know why Kino does, does those. So, um, why apply deep, deep learning? So, like I said, like AI is really, really huge right now. Um, China just announced that they want to be leader in AI in 2025. There's massive amounts of investments going on right now. China's number one as of 2015. USA is right there with a lot of it from the private sector. China's really leading with the, um, with the public sector. And so there's kind of like a really huge AI arms race right now, right? Everybody's talking about AI. Everybody's saying, oh, it's the coolest thing ever. I can make a flying car. You know, I can read your mind. And so part of the, my goal, I guess, with this was to show a little bit about what I was doing and to meet people who are also doing things to, to, to sort of increase the democratization of AI in Munich. And so um, that's sort of to the goal. And, you know, maybe somebody's making a Schwarzenegger Terminator 2 which would be awesome. So, um, so let's go on here. A little bit about me. Um, I'm originally from California, so my background's EE, but I worked in technical sales before for a large company near Osp Ospenhof here in Munich. And um, yeah, so I sort of took a long sabbatical and went on this. And so um, my family um, has a lot of background in, in healthcare. So my sisters are doctors in California, and my mom um, helped run one of the largest hospitals in Los Angeles. So part of growing up, I was always sort of introduced to their problems, whether it was patients, whether it was EMRs, whether it was billing. Um, I sort of, you know, being the youngest in the family, you sort of listen to you, blah, 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 work was tough, okay, all right, blah, blah, blah. Um, and so uh, what I focus on right now is medical text and entity extraction. So while this talk is primarily about PyTorch and what I've learned, um, I'm going to try and give a background of what the medical aspects are and where I really think the next biggest wave of what people should work on or look at is on the medical side because there is a ton of work going on right now with Twitter and I can analyze sentiments of your emojis. That's cool, right? But you'll see later on. So um, let's go on here. So like I said, my goal is to really tell you a story of why I think this is important here. Um, and I'm going to do that by showing you the sequence to, to sequence neural, trans, uh, neural translation model. And hopefully I can explain it in a way that isn't too confusing or people can actually get it. Um, we'll see. And show it to you a bit in Apply towards. Like I said, I'll release a notebook later so that you can sort of learn it. I figure reading code for one hour on a screen is probably not the best way to people learn it, and I probably couldn't, couldn't follow it. I'm a very visual learner, so I like to have stuff like this. So, and then take that model and then discuss how we can use that same model to a whole slew of different tasks. It's not just machine, um, it's, not, it's not just machine trans, trans, translation, but why are we even focusing on language, right? Everybody's talking about their self-driving cars. Everybody's talking about how they can do 
vision, but I personally believe that language, language trans translation is extremely Im important right now. And as we, as, as we can tell here in Europe, um, there's so many different languages, so many different people. And as an American moving here learning German, I'm always fascinated almost every day when I can see how many different cultures there are in one small sp sp space. Whereas in California, it's a size, it's a little bit smaller than the size of, of Germany, but that's one state, right? And so Europe especially and worldwide, there's so many issues in terms of getting proper trans translation that extend beyond what Google even does, right? Um, and so that's why it's still important now, um, especially in this era of hyper-globalization, whatever you want to call it, there's still a big application space, especially as we get more, more, more connected with the East. Asian languages are very, very different. And so it's still important to this day as we get more connected and we're here to be able to effectively communicate. And as we can tell, um, languages are different, right? So languages are ambiguous. English is weird, right? We, we can say, hey, let's make up something. We made up from our fight, or let's make out. Um, I don't know how many of you guys know English well, but let's make out means let's, let's kiss. So English is very ambiguous like that because contexts are very different. You have the same word make or made, past tense of, of, of make, has three completely different meanings. German doesn't have this so much, I, 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 I find myself. And so this is sort of where you get you know, funny things. Holy cow is not responsible for your vehicle. True, I guess. Translate server error. I don't know if that's the right translation for it, but maybe. So um, yeah, so there's, there's a lot of um, different ways of even looking at the world through the language that, that you speak. And so German, I especially like myself because it's very clear in its way of speaking, and I really like that, especially in the way that it makes uh, words, but as we know, as we can see here, translation can go wrong often, right? So um, this is some examples of where English is hard to see. The Pope's baby steps on gays. Um, hmm, didn't think that was totally probably right. Juvenile court to try shooting defendant. Maybe it'll work. Um, avoid having baby at the dinner table. Probably true. You know, boy paralyzed after tumor fights back to gain black belt. Impressive. Um, man pulls a needle from foot he swallowed 66 years ago. Impressive. I wonder where that was. So as we can tell, you know, I mean, granted, there's some commas removed for, you know, um, to make things look a little bit different or maybe not. Who knows? It could be just a really bad translation. And so, like I said, um, getting a correct translation is hard. Um, there's various, even, even from person to person, you can really sort of, um, oh, the grays aren't showing up here, right? Uh, people are seeing blue here, right? I'm not just colorblind, right? Yeah, blue, okay, cool. Um, it's supposed to be gray, but um, yeah, so various languages, um, every, people interpret things differently. Um, there's, especially for like medical text, there's a lot of different ways of saying the same thing. So while Google has done a great job pioneering on translation services, there's still so much more to do and so much more to look at. And as we know here, for, for, for me, um, when I buy a coffee at the train station, say, um, somebody will speak back, back, back to me in Byerish and then I'll just be like, what? Because I'm learning my German and I practice it, but then I'll hear something back and I say, well, I have no idea what they, what they said. And then I'll ask my friend and she'll say, oh, well, that was just Byerish. And I'll be like, oh, of course, you know, I should, should have gotten that. But the U.S. has that, that problem too. Um, we have the Southern twang, Louisiana is interesting. There is a really, there's a really sort of isolated, relatively group of Scots and Dutch um, in the Appalachian Mountains in West Virginia, who speak a very sort of mixed English, Scottish, kind of very heavily toned language. Um, it's very hard for even me to understand. So language itself is kind of very fluid, right? There's no real one way of looking at it. So this is an example of medical text. Lobular carcinoma in situ. It's an, it's an abnormal collection of cells 
in the breast. It's not, it's not cancer, but it's abnormal, where if you have it before menopause, you're more likely to have, have, have cancer later. So in deep, in deep learning and machine learning, the, the problem is that you have 22 ways of saying the same thing. How do you create a system that can accurately identify what you're saying? You have all these different ways in situ carcinoma with both ductal and lobular, in situ carcinoma with features of both lobular. I mean, that's, it's, it's a very difficult problem that extends from saying, I ate food, right? So it's, it's, um, that, that, that's why like, this field is sort of important because it, it, it extends across a lot of different areas. Does that make sense? Am I going too fast, too slow? Yeah, no? Good, cool. So here's an example of what I work with. This is a medical note from a patient um, from the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center at MIT um, to work on entity extraction. This is an 81-year-old female with a history of emphysema not on HOMO2 who presents with three days of shortness of breath thought by her primary care doctor to be a COPD flare two days prior to, to admission. No caps, nothing, just doctor didn't really care, right? The doctor's job is to treat the patient. It's not to accurately write for machine learners and researchers um, what, what happened. So <laughs> that's what we have to deal with. And that's often true, whether it's not even medical, whether it's just working with text data, Twitter is obviously the worst, but you have a lot of data for it. So, um, so this is sort of an example of where things can be sort of tricky. So like I said, um, deeper problems still exist. Uh, you have stuff with legal stuff. I've, um, I can read German okay, Der Spiegel and stuff like that, I can, I can get by. But then if I read something like um, tax, tax law, impossible, because there's so many different words that are so rare. Insurance, the same thing. Um, you have medical notes, like I, I said. And so one of the biggest issues right, right now why I still want to say that this is important is because it's not just basic translation. There's so many things that are going on beyond it on the, on the actual commercial side, research side, that I think people should really focus on. And like I said, if you read a lot of the research papers, they tend to use the same data sets over and over and over. Common crawl, Wikipedia news articles, and that's okay because it creates a standardized method of quantifying your score, but it limits you to, I think, more difficult problems that exist in this area that researchers are now beginning to really tackle. And I mean, everybody talks about their sentiment, analysis using the IMDB data set. Um, they talk about how, uh, you know, Twitter, and there's, if you look at a graph somebody showed me of the amount of NLP research done, Twitter's like this, cancer's like this, right? But what is the most applicable thing we really want to worry about here? God forbid anybody in this room's parents, sisters, brothers themselves have have cancer, I think they're more, more concerned about cancer than they are about the emoji neuron in their neural network, right? So that's why I think it's important. So um, part two, that was sort of an introduction of language and why I think it's important. Let's get to solving something. Um, so what I wanted to do now is sort of cover a little bit of what the Google model does. And so we can't go too deep into it because it simply would take too much time to describe all the little parts of it. But what we're going to do is we're going to go into the model and sort of describe the basic sequence to sequence model. And once we learn that, we're going to go into PyTorch and sort of show how it's built and why that's important. And then take what we've learned and then go through that and say, okay, well, this is where we can apply this. This is where we can uh, apply that and that. So let's go through there. So how do we solve it? Deep learning, of course, but you all know deep learning, this is all new to, not new to you, most of you. If you don't know it well, <coughs> obviously it has made a big impact. For example, computer vision, self-driving cars, medical radiology, imaging, tons of startups now, accessibility, big government, uh, product recommendation systems, NLP, tons of things. So, like I said, 
we're going to define the data set and then discuss the actual model and then show it through in PyTorch. So um, this was only three years ago, uh, less than that actually, um, when the first neural tra translation paper was released by, Go by Google. <clears throat> this is how fast this in, in, entire market is moving um, and to where we are now. Basically everything else before this was phrase-based, syntax-based, machine translation models. And starting in 2015, last year, they basically destroyed them. So not destroyed them, but they caught up and have really made a lot of performance now. And especially this year with a lot of the newer models, which I'll, I will dis discuss at the end, <coughs> are really sort of showing more promise to be even better. So um, a little bit of our translation task here. Um, we're going to use something called the Workshop on Machine Trans Translation data set. It's sort of a collection of news sources like Wikipedia, New York Times, that you can use back and forth to go back. But something interesting that I personally found, and I haven't gotten a good answer for yet, but I can think of m myself, is German has a typically lower blue score than English and French. And so a blue score is sort of like a score um, that they use to compare against multiple translations by humans. And so they compare what you get out to what an actual person thinks. Because, you know, person to, to person will actually translate it slightly differently, right? The words you choose, the context, the phrasing, often depends on where you're from and how you say things. And so you can't get, there's no one true translation really. Um, but generally, um, that score is lower for German. It's very interesting. And I, I don't know if it's only because the data sets are not good or if only it's because um, the similarities between English and French words are more. more. Um, like English has a lot of words borrowed from, from, from French, but English has a German foundation of the language, right? So German originally came with a mix of Frisian and then went to, um, is with the Saxons and then um, came mixed into the UK where, where it is now with the mix of the, of the French words. So it's very similar to German, but obviously the grammar is much more complex, which is to my, you know, makes it much, much harder for, for me to get right. Um, but yeah, so um, we will do sentence by sentence of unfixed length. That's very important here. Um, because most text comes unfixed, right? You have a long sentence, you, you, you have a short sentence. Um, and this model is going to be very similar to the Google system, minus some extra, I'm um, sorry, minus some extra parts beyond the scope of this talk, specifically things like attention, um, but I'll try and touch on them a bit, but that's basically it. But my point in this entire talk is that once you learn the basics of it, like a Lego model almost, you can apply it deeper and understand even some of the most cutting edge papers generally. And so that's the goal here is to sort of de demystify some of, the, um, some of the shroud behind what this field has. So what is a neural machine translation system exactly? A neural machine translation system is the approach of modeling an entire translation process via one big artificial neural network. Now that's, Obviously, okay, duh, but that's kind of a big thing because before what people did was they had a lot of statistics based into it, saying um, Der Spiegel often comes in with news, Zeitungen, type of things like that, right? Um, they had a lot of rule-based systems and there was a lot of human effort going into making rules of how to make an actual translation system. Now that's important because we don't do any of that. We define a model and then we run it and the model learns itself the rules. It learns itself this. And that's really important because like I showed before, um, people spent years on this stuff, long time. And then this thing came on and wow. So in terms of the actual model, that is very important. And I forgot to say that same exact model used now is used by Google, Facebook, eBay, Apple, Microsoft, I mean, everyone. And little interesting thing to say on that later, too. So I'm going to skip over this quick because most people know what, what it is. If you have no idea what a neural network is, basically an artificial neural network is an interconnected group of nodes akin to the vast network of neurons in a, a brain. 
Here, each circular node represents an artificial neuron, and an arrow represents a connection from the output of one neuron to the input of another. Can have values between 0 and 1, and are propagated down the network, and weights are adjusted using something called backpropagation. Show of hands, backprop backpropagation, you know it or don't? Uh, yes, raise your hands if you do. OK. Uh, who has no idea what it is? Totally, totally fine. No, no problem. Raise your hands. One, yes. One person here is not, not shy. Um, OK, so you all know what that is. That's, that's great. So, um, and if you, if you don't, basically, backpropagation is a way of adjusting the weights as you pass your data through the network and saying, OK, I got this. It should be this. Let me tweak that. And that's a very high level, high, high level view of uh, calculus. <laughs> but um, so what occurs on the sequence to sequence model here? Basically, very simply, we encode our sentence or word, and then we get a numerical value of dubis v eine bluma, of you are like a flower. And so the German gets translated into a embedding of words. And if you guys were here last month, I think it was last month when Sergi did the embedding, um, the embedding meeting, uh, you should know what that is. If you don't, basically, really, really dumbed down version of it is that the embedding is just a word in a, in a scalar form of multiple values like, like this. Then it's passed through, and it's decoded to you are like a flower. So um, this is a little bit further here. Um, apparently, this is a word, a phrase that every German says. Just kidding. Um, but it's echt dicke kiste, awesome sauce. Uh, judging by everybody's faces here, it's probably not true. But somebody decided to put it like that. So, um, but, so let's, um, how many of you are familiar with recurrent neural networks? Show of hands. You know what they are, have used them. OK, so not so much. So um, what we're doing here is basically the first thing we're going to do, like I said before, we're going to encode a word. We're going to turn the German word into a series of numbers, a series of scalars. And then we're going to feed that into one, one neuron. And that neuron itself has kind of a memory. Um, and there's a couple of different neurons. One's called the LSTM, and one is called a GRU. Um, they sort of do the same thing, different, but we'll talk about that. Um, so you pass in this weight, and the H is called a hidden state. And that state sort of holds a memory of what it saw before. And so you feed this through, and then you say, OK, ect, and then I saw dika, and then kista. And so that is those three things up, up top stay, stay the same. It's called an unrolled neural network. And that basically is just the same thing, but it feeds in each, each, each word, has a sort of a memory of what it saw before, and then it outputs it into a recurrent neural network again. And then those weights, or the values there, are then outputted to say, OK, I think it's awesome sauce, like that. And so um, how we choose the word is, and this is also a very interesting part, and a very, very difficult part, too, is that we choose the word from a probability distribution. We do something what's called a softmax. And who here knows about softmax? Raise your hand how softmax works. OK, so a few. Um, basically, softmax is basically um, a probability distribution, and you take the highest probability. So what you do is you say, I think the word is 60% most likely awesome. And then the next word is 70% most likely sauce. So you say awesome sauce. Um, and so there is, we'll, we'll get into that and how that works, but that's the basic gist of it. Does that make sense? Yeah? Sort of? Show of hands, too fast, too slow? I'll take that as a, okay. But um, as we come back, sorry, lost it. So the most important thing is to really just understand that the sentence gets encoded into a vector of words, or a vector of numbers, excuse me. And then it's sent through this network. It holds a memory. And then it's sent back out through a something called a de 
decoder. And that decoder then chooses what the word or anything could be. You're, ch you're, you're training it on words, and that's important to remember. But you could train it on other things, too. You could train it on medical inform information. The patient died. The patient didn't die. The patient had cancer. You could train it on financial information. You could say, oh, that's wrong. That's, everything is wrong until I see financial 10K data. That's very important because this is translation, but real realistically, the same stuff could be applied to a lot of different things. So this is the full model here. And unfortunately, the projector is not showing colors right. So apologies for that. Is Sergi here? I think he stepped out. Um, yeah, so this is the full model. And what we're going to see here is that the goal, if you're sort of new to this stuff, is to not sort of get confused by seeing a whole array of things. That's not, that's not the whole point. The point is viewed as sort of as, as like Legos. Each one of these is the unrolled recurrent neural network, and then it goes through for each time step, each word, saying D, pro, pro, I'm not even going to try and say it right now. Um, basically, it puts in each word, and then you have a full context meaning um, built up. And then it passes that through over once it sees end of, end of sentence, and then it says, okay, I should start choosing what the word should be. Now, this part here is called teacher forcing. And what this does is that it keeps sort of an, an, in, an enhanced memory by saying, okay, I had the, and then I, I said, okay, it should be protests escalated over the weekend end. And so that's basically, it's the same thing as what we saw before, encoder, decoder, but then you're feeding what you said before out. And so that's sort of the basic sequence-to-sequence -sequence model. And, um, and then at each output, you're choosing the softmax of what the word, word should be in the word space. So, um, and so, and then um, as you run that, as you train that, you tune your, your, your weights, your model. So um, yeah, does that make sense? Should I go back to anything? Was anything not clear? Please. Um, so that's sort of the, the interesting part about these neural networks is that it's a mix of both, is that you tune the weights inside so that normal old school trans translation systems would have rules. Like they would say, if you see this, this is a phrase that is common, and then it should be this. This has a way of learning those rules itself by tuning the weights through back propagation. Now this is a pretty basic version of what we saw just now, but what this is what this is doing is that it's building up a context over time of the whole sentence because it's keeping what the word was before doing some stuff within the uh, do in the actual cell and saying, okay, how much of the word should I keep? Should I forget should, like should I forget the, should I forget D or das? Um, or there, so um, that's sort of what is going on inside there. The reason why it kind of seems like black magic is because a lot of the weights and a lot of the things you don't see or see yourself, and that's sort of the problem, not problem, but sort of the abstraction that some people don't like about these type of networks um, is that you don't see a lot of the rules that it defines them it itself, because it defines these rules itself through back, prop back propagation, but one thing that I noticed even in the Google system too was that it won't really get words like this, phrases like this, right? Really sort of, um, like I had a slide that had a lot of interesting phrases that didn't really translate well in German. And so um, it, that's sort of an example. Like the real, like this is sort of the limitations of it, more of a limitation of the data set where um, what you show is it, it only trains on proper things. like language, their spiegel, and, and stuff like that. So it doesn't mean it's not capable of it. It's just not trained on the right stuff. But when your data sets are news and Wiki Wikipedia, you probably won't see ect dicke kista, right? So does that make sense? Um, we could always talk more afterwards, too. So that's sort of the basics of the model. And again, just remember that it encodes the information over time, passes it through to the D 
coder, it chooses which, what word to actually choose via soft, uh, via soft max, and then goes out from there. So like I said, how do we choose the word output? Um, softmax, right? That's, uh, I couldn't really have a talk here unless I threw in some fancy uh, equation here. So um, softmax gives you, using this equation, gives you the estimated prob probability for each, each word, and then you choose the word with the highest probability. Um, and that's it. Problem with that, you know, German has thousands of words, right? Um, every single language does. That's super computationally expensive per word. Imagine if you have a whole paper. Um, so there's other optimizations for that called beam search and greedy search, but they're kind of beyond the scope here, but relatively simple to implement. So um, with that, we're going to build it in PyTorch. Um, but we're going to take a, let's see, how are we on time right now? Let me quickly check, see where we are. We're already at 7, 7.50. Um, let's take a quick five minute, sorry, yeah. Yes. So that fits over here. So see where you see how the word comes out and goes back in? That's where you learn the context of the previous words, too. And um, I kind of abstracted some of those things, too, because that's a very good question. When you convert the word to these types of numbers here, you often would use, it's called embeddings. And so what you do before you even run this is that you analyze tens of thousands of texts, and you learn the occurrences of words. Um, and th there's a separate model called skip gram or continuous bag of words. And what that basically does, it learns sort of the distribution space of words. And, that's how, and then you feed that into here, and it says, OK, um, I know that um, protests escalated is kind of, you know, protests will either increase, decrease, happen. You learn sort of how words interact with, with each other for that. Now, I'm going to talk about that at the end, um, but that's a good point. Does that make sense? Cool. Um, so with that, let's take just like a, a five-minute break. You guys can grab some more beers if you want, and um, I'm going to get some more water.
Okay, guys, let's uh, slowly make our way over, and then we'll keep on going. Okay, so <coughs> um, we're going to take this model, this uh, sequence to sequence model, and we're going to try to actually implement it. So uh, for those of you who are very good deep learning ninjas, I'm going to abstract a lot of stuff simply for the sake of time, unfortunately. But um, first of all, why PyTorch and yet another deep learning framework? You know, why do we need to care about this? Um, yeah, so why is this cool? There's so many other things like TensorFlow, MXNet, Keras, Cafe, Theano. Um, <clears throat> and just a word of advice, if you're pretty new to, to this field, don't use PyTorch. It's, it's going to be too much of, of a pain because it's a very low-level low, low language. Keras is by far, you should use that. Don't use anything else. Keras is very simple. It's meant to help you, especially if you are new. Um, I haven't had any experience with CAFE or MXNet, but I know somebody here who says good things about MXNet, maybe. So, <laughs> um, yeah, so, and TensorFlow I also like too, but um, TensorFlow is a little bit sort of obtuse for me to use, I guess. It's hard to explain. That's my personal opinion. Sorry if anybody here loves it. Um, so, um, they're all great, and they're just different. But um, if they're all the same in one way, though. And how they are the same is that they are static. Um, let's see if this works. Oops. They are static versus dynamic, and I'll get into that. But um, PyTorch is brand new, released this year in January. So it's really sort of kind of hitting the stage with fire, I, I guess, and going off really, really fast. Um, it's kind of like a GPU accelerated version of NumPy. I don't know how many of you are familiar with NumPy, but basically allows you to do the math that is done with the deep learning in, in a much more lower, lower level too, on, even on the tensors and the, the matrices too. It's very, very fast, has very, very low overhead, and it has, for, for those of you doing vision, it's excellent for <coughs> a lot of its extensions for vision and text. And so it has th something called dynamic grass. And someone asked me a question about variable lengths during the break, and that's very important because so why, what is the difference between a dynamic and static graph? Um, as we can see here, a sentence can have variable length, right? But all the other frameworks, it's called define and run. You define your network. I will have a sentence of length 10, and that is it. You define it, and it's set. If you have a sentence of length 5, you have to pad it with zeros. Sentence of length, length 2, that's really, really short, pad it. And so um, you can call your prediction at the end of, of the sentence, but you get into problems with memory. That's why in vision, for those of you doing vision work, is why every picture has to be one size, because you define your graph beforehand, and that size cannot change. TensorFlow does have sort of a dynamic part to it. I haven't seen anybody use it. I can't speak anything to it. but. Um, so PyTorch is more defined by run. And so what's important with that is that you can define it by the length of your sentence, your text, your paragraph, your picture, whatever. So it's much more dynamic like that. Um, <coughs> so this, this way, it helps for me in my field because um, for the data set that I work with right now, um, 53,214 ICU patients from the MIT Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center over 15 year span. I deal with notes ranging from zero to something in between six and a half thousand words. Simply cannot do good work without having a dynamic 
graph. You could do, you could break it up and mix it in and stuff like that. That's possible, of course. But for real world stuff like this, you need to be able to have a graph that's f that's f that is f flexible. If you're doing stuff like sentiment, maybe not. Um, but even then, um, you know, text deserves the respect that it gets, right? I mean, it's it's very very hard, and there's a lot of things with that. So. Um, so yeah, so this is very important for things where you can't sort of lose accuracy, right? If you're doing billing, insurance, patient outcomes, research, you don't want to scan a whole length of text, cut it off at the end, only to miss the fact that the patient was not sick with that at the end or something like that, right? Those are all things that are very important. Um, and so PyTorch is unique where the graph is defined by run, not versus define and run. And so that was sort of the message that I wanted to sort of get out through, through here is how it's different with a dynamic graph. And that I really think will be the future with a lot of this sort of stuff because um, you will run into more flexible images, data sets and stuff like that, audio, right? And you need to have that flexibility there. So our first steps for building the model, like I said, we're going to define our total graph. And the graph is the sequence to sequence model. And um, we're going to initialize it, define our layers, the hidden layers. Um, we're going to calculate and define our forward pass. And a forward pass is basically inputting the words or inputting our picture, whatever, for the neural network to either classify, translate, whatever. We then calculate a loss and say, okay, how close were we to what we had? Did we get the actual outcome or was it com completely off? And then we just do last loss dot back prop. That's it. And so we define our, trading, our training model, like our loop, and then we just run it. That's it. So I know this is a lot of code and I can't run through the whole thing, but I just want to show you sort of the basics of it, right? Again, so we know what the encoder level is, right? We're just encoding it. Um, for those, for those who asked me about, um, you asked me about doing word, word to word. This is the embedding layer here that will encode some of the initial context of those words. Like, if you are talking about king, you know that a queen is sort of related, or a castle and a, a moat. That's sort of what the embedding layer helps initially put in on the context. And so um, what we're doing here is we're defining the initial layer here. Basically, we have our input layer. We have the encoder here. So our hidden layer is the size of basically this stuff here, right? How long it'll actually be. Um, but it's defined also by our, our input size, like the length of our sentence. Um, and then, so for those of you who are very familiar with um, recurrent neural networks, you know you have to set your internal uh, unit size, and so you define that. And so here we're going to use our GRU, which has our hidden size here. GRU is a gated recurrent unit. It's a type of recurrent unit that helps decide how much memory to have. It does it all inside. Um, and then we have a forward pass here. This defines what we do. So we defined it here, and then we say, okay, what do we do to actually run it? So we have sequence length is just the length of our words. Boom, that's it, done, easy. Um, embedded is the embedding. So we get the word in, we get the word inputs, um, we get the actual words, and then we get the actual matrix from what I showed before, the actual numbers of what that word means. So we take um, ect, dicka, kista, and the embedding layer turns it into the actual scalars, vectors. Um, and then we say, OK, our output is this. Um, the hidden is because if you remember from here, we have a hidden layer, and then, and then we have the output vector here. So it's sort of this, it's doing this for each time step, right? It's going whoop, 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 if that makes sense. And then output here. And then we simply return the output layer here. And this is to initialize our hidden layer, for those of you who know recurrent neural networks here. Going further, um, it's probably a little bit too far uh, for the length of this talk, but I just wanted to show briefly how we take from a picture what we understood, hopefully, or got the idea of what's going on here, and how we define that within this actual framework. So the decoder is the same thing, but backwards, right? Um, so we receive our, our vector, we have a, a GRU, we have the output, um, and then for the forward pass, we take the residuals, 
which is just the output from the encoder, um, through the actual GRU, which is the decoder, the S, the first thing there. And then we calculate a loss, or we, we sorry, we calculate the actual softbacks. We choose our word. Um, and so we go here. This is, there's some uh, array calculations and stuff like that going on. Um, but we're just calling softmax. And then we're returning it. That's it. And it, it, it extends itself by from before from the input size. So the amount of times it actually runs is just set by the input size length. That's it. So if you had a picture that was varying in size, you could do the same thing too by your convolutional network, whatever, or if you had anything else. If you're working with uh, time series data, same thing, variational time series, stuff like that. So um, I know this is probably fast, but like I said, I, I don't want to go through the code itself and have you guys know how to code it at the end. I can send you guys stuff afterwards and spend all the time you want, but I wanted to at least show sort of the simplicity of it at least. Um, so we have our model defined. How do we train it? For those of you who are very good at neural networks, you know that we have to zero the gradients of our optimizer. We set our loss function to initially zero. We have our input length, target length. So this is for training. This is not for inference. So we're training on it. So the output sentence, as we know in German, could be shorter or, or longer, or it, it, it could have one long word too. So we set, <coughs> we simply run the words through it. We calculate our loss function. I had to drop that part off, I'm sorry. But we run the words through it. We calculate the softmax, as I said, like what the actual words are. And then to get it, we just do loss.backward. That's it. And then it back propagates for each iteration. And so um, that's pretty amazing. And so there's, there's a lot of flexibility for that. Um, and it's the, the thing that I personally like, and again, this is only me, I personally like about it is because nothing's sort of abstracted away from you. Um, Keras kind of does that a lot. Uh, this doesn't. So you have a lot of flexibility. And that's why today, most or a lot of the papers are releasing their code in PyTorch because it's easier to make the code, sort of like, which I'll, I'll, I will talk about at the end. But re remember, all we're doing is we're defining our model as we saw before here. And then we're saying, OK, uh, some of the basic neural network stuff, zero our, our gradients, set our, in, our, our inputs here, get the outputs, calculate our loss function, backpropagate. And you do that in a for loop for each time. And then you just return it, and you iterate, iterate, iterate. And that's, that's, this is, again, this is a big abstraction of it, but this is kind of it. And so that's cool because you can do a lot of your tensor stuff inside of it. You can do a lot of funky things with this. Um, and so that's why I think PyTorch, especially for text, is really important because you can get a lot more of a dynamic level of your text from that. So does that make sense, kind of? Question. Correct. Yeah, so um, how it learns it is that with our training data itself, um, we, like, so what we're, what we're doing here is that we are um, basically, uh, where, where, where was it here? Uh, decoder. Target length, right? So we have, we have a, a, a target out, we have a target output for this actual training. So through our text, um, we're going to have tens of thousands of articles and stuff like that. Some of them will have hound and dog in them. If it doesn't, then it's a bad data set. But um, so that's sort of where it learns that stuff. That eventually, the first pass through it, it'll not learn it. But then it'll get a bad score of that loss. And through back propagation, it'll tune the weights inside of it, inside this model here. And then it will say, OK. Um, next time I see hound, I know it's dog. And so it's, it's, it's kind of the black boxiness of neural networks and stuff. But it, w this is, again, kind of like a simplified model of it. But there's, 
there's millions and millions and millions of weights inside of it, and it's tuning each one sort of in its own, own way. And the embedding layer itself, the actual context of words that, that it feeds into here, has already some information built into it, knowing that, that, um, that king and queen are similar, or like if the sentence said the uh, German shepherd, the German shepherd dog, so it knows dog hund type of thing, those, it, it, it encodes it into a vector space here that allows it to sort of get that context away pretty fast, and so it can learn it. Um, and so I should have included a slide on, on embeddings. I thought it might be too much, but um, yeah. So I can release some more stuff afterwards to sort of, uh, this is a very, very simplified model of this and it is missing a lot. So try not to read this and say, now I know what to do because you won't. But the point that I'm showing is that the basic stuff that every neural network does is shown here, right? Back propagation, your loss function. And so that's where you really, really see it. So, voila. Did we build a universal tr translator for Captain uh, Kirk? Almost forgot his name. Um, no. Um, we, like I said, we, I, I, I abstracted a ton of stuff away, like data preparation, converting text to tokens, embedding spaces, the full training loop. Um, for those of you who are really, really deep into stuff, as you know, exploding and vanishing gradient issues, gradient clipping. Um, I skipped all of attention, um, but the basics are still the same. That's the one thing that, I, for those of you who are new, understand the basics are still the same, and it's not that different from what you saw here. So for those of you who, are, who, who think, oh, I can't get, get into this field, it's so hard, I don't think that, because it's definitely possible if you understand the model, sort of the basics of what we're doing here, then you can still apply it. And then you can take what you learn and apply it to different models too. When, when there's papers about something completely random, you have an idea of what they're doing. Um, and so that's why I tried to abstract some of the code too, because PyTorch really makes you learn the neural networks well, um, but also to do pow uh, powerful things quickly. What I like about it is that it's very easy to debug. If you, if you have a problem, it says, hey, I was expecting this, but I got this, right? And so that's sort of the issue where um, Keras tends to have an abstraction layer. You have to go into the back end of, of, of TensorFlow. Big problem, right? If, if, you, if, it's, if there's something going on, then it's very difficult to debug. However, PyTorch is excellent. It says, you said this, but I got this. And it tells you the exact int type, whatever, float long. Um, and so you, ca you have an idea of building a model very, very well. And so that's why I really, I, again, it's just me. It's just, just me, but I like PyTorch for that. So um, a brief look into the Google NMT system, and I know this is a horrible picture, but what I wanted to say is that, yes, it looks different, but you're still seeing the encoder decoder, right? Um, what they do, the reason why you see so many is that they have, because they're Google and they have billions of dollars, they have eight separate GPUs for each layer. So because they're going, going to get literally millions maybe per second wanting to translate something, they can say, all right, let's buy a ton of chips and make it parallelized. And so you're seeing sort of a parallel model here. They do some other things where they can do multiple languages at, at, at once, but don't be scared by it. It's the same thing. Um, it, the, the summing at the end is something called attention, which I skipped, but it's not that difficult. Um, but the model's still the, the same. It's still the same thing. And that's it. It's an encoder-decoder system that when you have, you know, 30, 300 billion a year that you make, you can afford stuff like this. So when you guys make it, you can buy me one too, just saying. Um, but does this really solve language? Like I said, no. Um, it, like I said, we're using publicly available data sets for research. Most of it's trained on news sources. In my experience, um, it still doesn't do a great job even on Der Spiegel. Um, and so Mrs. Slang and metaphors, and like I had somebody email me uh, using a lot of slang, and I couldn't even figure out w what was going on. I had to ask my friends. Um, longer sequences are harder. This is important because, um, as I said, 
when you speak with your friends, you're speaking in one way. When you're speaking with your colleagues, you're writing in a more professional way. There's a legal way of writing too. There's a different way of speaking. And getting that language together is a problem of data collection. And that's where I think like some people get sort of scared of Google or Facebook because they have so much data too. But if you find a niche, whatever your product is, you can still kill it because there's so much stuff to do. Legal, medical, everything. And so that's why it's important to understand the model and say, okay, well, how do I apply that? And so you can apply it to many, many different things. Named entity recognition, where you can scan a financial document and get the most important financial data out. I know a guy doing that in uh, Canada. Um, information extraction, same exact thing, where instead you're not, tr you're not saying your output should be a language, you're saying your output should be um, should be whether when you scan the actual data, whether it is um, how much you owe on a home loan, how much you owe uh, in your medical bills because it's the states and everybody's bankrupt from it, um, stuff like that, right? There's tons of s applications for this space using the same model but with various tweaks. And that's the point here is that if you understand the model, then you can apply it to tons of different things, and so that's where it gets to be very, very powerful for, for text. So a little bit more of medical data, right? Um, to wrap this up, <coughs> a vast amount of data actually exists now, and as you can tell, it comes through in such a uh, not pretty environment, so you have to do OCR, you have to... Um, you have to get so many different categorical data on the, on the drugs, the codes. How do we use what we do for language for improving diseases? You know, um, there's a lot of issues with patient privacy. Terms and acronyms I don't get. I'm not a doctor. Um, every drug could be used to map to some sort of outcome. But it's like we could either do, do Twitter or we could do medical stuff. I would hope we sort of focus on medical stuff too. Um, so, this is a statement. Today, almost all of our, our, our cancer treatment insights come from a tiny subset of clinical trial patients. In the United States, 1.7 million people are diagnosed each year with cancer, but only 3% enroll in clinical trials. To improve care for every patient, we need insights from the other 97% of people receiving cancer care. And so that's a pretty important thing. We're only gaining insights from 3% 3, 3 of the population, but we have data for 97% for the, for, for the other 97%. And all the stuff that we do on medical, um, on translation, on embeddings, is missing from this. I mean, this is where the real impact is, right? Because in the US and in Germany, the death rate for cancer, adjusted for size and age of the population, has dropped only 5% from 1950 to 2005. In contrast, the death rate for heart disease dropped 64% in that time, and for flu and pneumonia, it fell 58%. Breast cancer in Germany, 12% of all women will be afflicted with breast cancer. 5% of every woman born in this country will die of it. It's a very alarming research thing that I found when I was actually researching this. Um, but in Germany, as is in the States, population-wide numbers are very scant because data protection laws are strong, as they should be. But even getting anonymized patient data is difficult here because of, as you saw, the records are written and stuff like that. There's a whole issue for that too. But even for breast cancer, how do we know even what the distribution is? How do we figure out why people aren't being treated well? There's a lot of issues for that. So who can guess what the bi-state distribution is for breast cancer? Um, for the breast cancer rates and also the mortality rates for it. Here it is. Uh, more incidences of it. This, again, the projector is kind of not showing the colors right. It doesn't show grays. Um, there is more incidence of it in the, in the West and more people die of it in the West than in the East here. I don't know why. We don't know why. Maybe it's something in, 
who knows, right? But these are the kinds of problems that I wanted to say is that with these types of things, we can tackle with that. It's very important. Um, it could be how they di diagnose, how they treat, what they do, stuff like that. Uh, so, um, yeah, and there's a huge lack of data too. I mean, Botten, Burtenberg and Hesse are just decided not to even share it. But, um, but so I guess the point of this is that um, the same models can be used for things like this. So this is sort of an e example here of using the same model as we showed before to, uh, with obviously tweaks, but um, to be able to learn things like this. Invasive carcinoma, tumor size, grade three, lymphatic vessel invasion, not identified. Um, you know, so just a brief sort of way of showing how you can do it. So in the end, um, the future is also evolving quickly. Um, there was a recent paper by Salesforce on contextual vectors, which is really unique. Uh, Harvard, I know a guy at Harvard who's working on doing a medical question and answering system using millions of text documents and a relatively somewhat similar system is what we saw here. Um, embeddings are the future. Um, so basically, like I sort of touched upon too, embeddings are used for words and you, you can find similar context. But um, embeddings are also used for categorical variables, too. I have a data set with uh, 4 million patients scanned out of Pennsylvania that I can type in and say, okay, what do I find for lupus? It can find me treatments. It, it, it could find me um, common outcomes, common diseases. I mean, this is, not, this is protected patient info, but it's used by the same method of a skip gram model that the bag of words, um, that, that they use for words. And that's, it's incredible. It's like if you wanted to make a CDS, like a, it's called a uh, clinician decision support system, something like that, it's the same thing there. I, I showed it to my sister and who is a doctor, and, and she was like, yeah, it's the same thing that I learned over four years, but in just an embedding sp sp space. It's in incredible. So that's why I think, like, I guess to, to sum this all up is basically to show you what's possible, but also show you where you can take it with. And so that's the really hopeful message th that I think everyone gets from this, is to, is to not necessarily classify tweets, but to classify other things, too. And so transformer attentional models are big, but that's beyond the scope of this talk, too. There's a lot of things, and I hope that everybody at least is a little bit active in it. And um, yeah, so go do some cool things. I hope this helps. Don't be afraid to ask questions. I really believe that AI should be free, open, democratized and that uh, you guys can do some cool things with it. That's it. <laughs> okay, any questions? One second, sorry. We have a second microphone here. Pom pom. Yes, now it's going to be loud. Who was that? Yes. Can RNN use like a g generative adverse network for like generating loss of data? Like suppose we have loss of data and we want to create a fake of data? Yeah, so there is some research going on this, this year on using that for uh, medical records. Um, there's a really good paper out of Georgia Tech actually the release this year that did that and then some people in MIT that I know of doing that. Um, there's, I think there's a paper related to that being presented this, at the end of this week at the Boston Machine Learning um, Summit for Healthcare uh, by LMU actually. So um, yeah. There is, there is a lot of, um, that's a good way, it's, it's an active topic for how to look at patient data with privacy. Um, but uh, patient data has a lot of other issues with that too, obviously getting it from uh, paper form and different softwares and stuff like that. It's, it's a nightmare. So, yeah. Hi, um, thanks for the talk, uh, first of all. I had two questions. I was just wondering if the model saw a word that, has, that it hasn't seen in the training, how would it react? 
And the second question is, since um, the model is taken into account context of the previous words, do errors that it does at the beginning, beginning of a sentence, do they have more impact um, on the performance of the model? So do they weigh heavier? Um, I've only primarily used them with German, so they're both sort of similar enough compared to like other more languages like in Asia. So, um, you know, you typically start with like a pretty basic word in like the or the, er, will, he, she. So that context is pretty easy to start with, because, but um, you don't start with like typically larger nouns and stuff like that in these types of languages. Um, so in my work from what, what I've seen, I see most of the problems in contextual information, like saying phrases correctly that make sense, and that's the biggest issue. Getting the actual overall meaning um, is right. Like you may have a correct word-to-word -word trans translation, but oftentimes it may not. Just that doesn't sound right. It doesn't make sense. So the flow doesn't sound right, if if that makes sense. Whereas the actual word is just completely wrong. And how would the model deal with a word that hasn't seen before? I'm sorry. How would the model deal with a word that hasn't seen before? Um, it depends. So it can deal with German words because you can do character level stuff with this as, as, as well. So, you know, I forget the actual term for it, but German puts a lot of words as one word, right? And so it can break that out and see that there's actual individual words there. If it hasn't seen the word, word before, it will not translate it. Any other questions? Mm, yes, and s speaking of words, like you can also like in different way do embed like parts of the word. So you can have like you know word basically W O right, and after like can learn some parts of that. You can um, it knows some parts about that. So it's you don't need to have like exact uh, use case of that. You can have like some parts of it, but it works a bit slower there. Past text from Facebook. Who was you were right? Uh, what are the limitations of such a system? I'm sorry. Uh, what, what what are the limitations of it? What what problems does it not deal with? Well, of the of the sequence to sequence of the uh, model yeah, so that I showed you. Forward, backward looking, long. Um, I mean, this is primarily for like a categorical type of. Um, well, it's hard to explain. So this is this is good for like neural translation and stuff like that. Um, uh, I'm trying to think, like, for, for my work, if I'm scanning a lot of text, I have, like, uh, uh, for those of you who really know neural networks r relatively well, I have an output space of 7,000 sigmoids that I have to then optimize independently for that. Um, that's because I'm doing multi-label, multi-classification. Um, so the decoder model doesn't work well for, for that. Um, that's probably where I would say. But then, but I guess the... The concept still works, right? You may have to edit stuff, but the concept will work. Um, and again, I showed this primarily for language and textual work. So obviously it wouldn't work, I think, on images. I could be wrong. I haven't thought about that. So um, yeah, I think it just depends on the use case and how you have to change it. So thank you. Anybody? Yes, I see you. Uh, I don't have a question, I, I just want to give some information to the questions there, because we was, we're using a similar uh, software, we have developed it, and we're also using embedding. So we have started using word to work from uh, uh, Google, yep. which uh, requires hundreds, gazillions of millions of sentences, yep. which actually, if you have a billion sentences in one language, it's, it's quite good. What <coughs> happens there is that the sentence structure is stored in the word to vector. So actually there is, a, there is a statistical analysis of the language that is created. And it also going back to the previous question, if the word, if a word doesn't exist in this embedding, it is zero, so it cannot be used. But with the statistical uh, embedding or statistical analysis of the language embedded in there, you actually know all the possible permutations of a sentence. And then you can calculate, the, through the network, you can calculate all the probabilities of the next word that will show up because of the previous words, words, words. So that's what we do. Yep. And I, I don't know what kind of uh, embedding you use. Um, I use the word to vec. I actually was a big fan of 
Glove, but Glove is a little bit harder to get working for personal yeah, stuff. It's it's similar. And um, yeah, so I use WordTivec because the model actually performs the same as as Glove, um, from what I gather. And so um, yeah, Word Word to Vec is great. Yeah, I left out the embedding slide simply because there was a talk last month, right, Sergi, on it. So I said, okay, people have probably seen it. Um, yeah, I probably should have included something on it, but uh, yeah. Absolutely right. Yeah, but something that's a very important though with this is that um, I was going to include a slide, but I didn't have enough time. Is that word to vec is not only for text. Word to vec is for categorical data too. Like I was saying, um, there is a embedding data set for four million patients and their ICD codes. So you can find the nearest neighbors for rare diseases and stuff like that. And so you can see, uh, you get a proper distribution out of four million people what the most common uh, relationships are. And so the same thing that they do for, for text is the same thing you can do for population diseases. That, and you can find cures, not maybe cures is probably speaking too much, but you can find treatments and things like that. And this is it's it's crazy. It, it's it's it really is the forefront for that. I mean, as long as you see it as a sequenced pattern, so instead of a sentence, because yeah. in word to work, each word is converted to a number and then converted to a float, and you have a sequence of these floats. So as long as you see it as a sequence uh, sequenced pattern, you can use it for whatever you want. You can even use it for audio or video, which doesn't make sense because you need two dimensions, but you could theoretically use it, and for patient data, it's great. Yep. The thing is, just uh, you have to keep in mind that it's a, it's a hyperdimensional space where the relations are stored, and the same digit can uh, appear multiple times in <coughs> relation to other digits in previous and past. And you just have to make sure that the window that you're analyzing is small or large enough for the language or for the patient data you want to analyze. That's yep. the thing. So. Thank you. Good follow-up. Um, and I think uh, like on embeddings, we should have one video. We don't have really comparison between all of them, but I think it might be something for our next meetups. Basically. Yeah, we could do like a lining, yeah. lining talk on it for sure. Mm, the last one, or that's more or less all, and we go to networking part. Yeah? OK. So thank you again for a nice talk. Thank you, guys. And we still have like a bit of time, so feel free to hang around and uh, talk to people. Mix and mingle.